This is Dr. Finnell here in Wichita Falls. Yes. And um, you specialize in? I specialize in general surgery and bariatric surgery. And how many years have you been in practice? Uh, this is my fifth year in practice. And how many surgeries do you think you've done? Uh, bariatric surgeries, hundreds of bariatric surgeries. I don't think I can say thousands, but uh, I can confidently say hundreds. Before deciding, deciding to do the surgery, um, what would you recommend for people to do? Well, um, I do surgery on folks who, are, who qualify for bariatric surgery based on the National Institutes of Health's guidelines. So the first thing you have to do, if you think you qualify for bariatric surgery, is weigh yourself and figure out what your BMI is. If your BMI is greater than 40, then you're probably a candidate for weight loss surgery. If your BMI is between 35 and 40, then, and you have a health problem related to being overweight, then there's a good chance that you qualify for surgery. Um, if your BMI is less than 35, um, probably in that situation, um, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting uh, insurance carriers to cover an operation. Um, there might be some benefits actually scientifically to, actually, to having a weight loss procedure, um, but most carriers are not going to cover it at that point. Um, the lap band is actually approved, FDA approved, for people with a BMI between 30 and 35 if you have a uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, I believe. But I think it's kind of hard to get that approved. And um, so anyway, the first thing you have to do is look at your BMI. If your BMI, you can look up on the internet, any website or whatever, BMI calculator, you know your height and your weight, and you can punch that in and that'll tell you what, um, whether or not you're, you're a candidate for weight loss surgery. The other thing to think about is have you done anything to try and lose weight in the past? Uh, we don't, you know, if you've never tried to lose weight or focused on, um, you know, an exercise program or a focused diet program, um, the first thing to do is not just to jump to surgery. You should try and um, lose weight um, with non-surgical means, and um, so that would be the, that would be the first thing to do. But if you try to lose weight and you try to several different plans, and you are not having any success, and you put a lot of effort into it, and um, you qualify based on your BMI or based on your health problems, and you're concerned that your health problems are getting out of control, and that um, you think weight loss surgery might be a good option for you, then um, I would recommend uh, looking to see, to see your BMI and then uh, contacting um, your primary care doctor. They might be able to put you in contact with somebody who has who does weight loss surgery. But if you're wanting to do your own research, the um, ASMBS is the um, kind of our national society. Of weight loss surgeons, you can get on that website and uh, find a qualified uh, weight loss surgeon in your area, and that is ASMBS. What types of gastric surgeries are there? Um, weight loss surgeries have been around for a long time. Um, the three main surgeries in the United States now, um, and you could probably also say that there's a fourth, but the, the three main ones are the gastric bypass, which has been around probably the longest, and the next one would be the lap band, which is um, a, uh, another one. And the other one that's very common, it's becoming more common, is the uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. And another one that is kind of coming on that you might hear more and more about is the duodenal switch. Um, so those are the three main surgeries. Um, if you look around, there's probably some other ones. There's one called the vertical banded gastroplasty that's really not done anymore. Um, there's a gastric plication that's another thing that's being done at some centers around the country, but that's in special trials. But your main ones that you're going to know, people, family members, whatever that have had, are going to be the, the bypass, the band, or the sleeve. Um, and then the next question is, okay, what are those operations? And I will briefly go through each one of them. Number one, the gastric bypass. So the gastric bypass uh, works by uh, 
you're not able to eat as much and what you do eat you don't absorb normally so we go in we separate out the top part of the stomach away from the main part of the stomach and then we go down and we uh, cut the intestines and bring up the intestine and reattach it to the stomach pouch and then reconnect the stomach down here and um, this is like a, a Y so it's called the Ruin Y gastric bypass so food comes down uh, it goes into the uh, pouch uh, it's not very big it's usually about the size of a of a chicken egg and I like to tell patients that after a gastric bypass you should think about a meal as being about if you can imagine unscrewing the very top of an egg and filling it with food and that's about how much a meal is going to be after a gastric bypass and then the food travels down this part of the intestine and it meets up with all of the intestinal juices right here and so you can't eat much and the food that you do eat is not absorbed completely normally um, so the good things about this operation is that it's excellent for control of diabetes uh, it's excellent for weight loss if you're a hundred pounds over your ideal weight you're going to end up losing about 75 pounds on average give or take a few pounds on either side of that for the typical patient who has this operation um, so diabetes control is excellent weight loss is very reliable it's very hard to not lose any weight if you have this operation um, what else uh, there are risk it's a major surgery I always tell patients that none of these operations are perfect um, these are all imperfect solutions to complex problem the complex problems obesity and people can be very successful with any of these operations or they can have terrible complications uh, with any of them uh, people can always regain weight with any bariatric surgery if enough time goes by and people eat enough food they can always put back on weight anytime you have surgery on your abdomen and on your intestines you're at increased risk for having bowel blockages from scar tissue that's a risk of this procedure um, ulcers gastric bypass patients are at risk for developing ulcers so you have to avoid medications and substances that cause ulcers smoking is very dangerous after a gastric bypass uh, it can cause ulcers and ulcers can bleed they can rupture they can cause narrowing of the connections so gastric bypass patients should never use nicotine because it's the nicotine that causes the ulcers uh, caffeine I tell my patients that you know if you drink a little cup of coffee every day and you're not having any problems that's probably okay but gastric bypass patients probably shouldn't be chugging down a vente Starbucks twice a day because <laughs> that's they're gonna run into trouble if they're doing that uh, other things lots of alcohol once again in moderation I, I think that once you've lost your weight and you're, you're you're doing good and you're not having any problems I don't think it's a you know it's a cardinal sin for a gastric bypass patient to have a glass of wine or a a margarita or something every now and then but if you're drinking taking a lot of alcohol in after a bariatric surgery you're going to gain you're not going to lose as much weight and it can cause ulcers um, what else uh, gastric bypass patients have to take vitamins uh, for the rest of their life if they don't they can get vitamin deficient and key vitamins vitamin b12 thiamine uh, folate vitamin d uh, calcium and iron are absorbed in this part of the intestines and you don't have any food going over that in the gastric bypass so especially young women who still have a menstrual cycle are at risk for having uh, iron deficiency and uh, calcium metabolism can be thrown off after a gastric bypass and it could make you have increased risk for kidney stones and um, as far as we know the best way to prevent that is to take a calcium supplement gastric bypass patients should take about two grams a day of calcium citrate um, once everything's you know they're through their initial phases of the surgery um, we talked about ulcers we talked about vitamins right around the time of surgery there's risk of bleeding there's risk of leaks uh, there's risk of hernias um, you'll probably if you get this surgery be on a strict diet in the days following the surgery and it's important to follow that diet um, long term there's risk of weight regain uh, there's risk of bowel blockages there's something called an internal hernia where the intestines can slip behind each other and I always warn my gastric bypass patients that 
you know, everything can be going great and you can have lost 150 pounds and everything's perfect. And if you start having severe pain um, and it's not getting better, you need to be let your bariatric surgeon know because that is not normal. You could have a twist or something going on in there that could be called an internal hernia. And your ER doctors and your primary care doctors and other doctors that aren't um, bariatric surgeons may think that something else is going on and they could miss that and it could be a could be a bad problem. So if you're having issues and you're not getting better, you've got to be your own best advocate. And you say, let me talk to somebody who does these operations because I think something's wrong. Um, so that's the gastric bypass. We talked about the weight loss. We talked about the good things. Uh, we talked about some of the risk. Um, uh, let's talk about the band. The band is, um, is a commercially available product. It's made by Allergan. It's been around close to, getting close to 10 years. Um, it's probably the safest operation right around the time of surgery because there's no cutting of the intestines and there's no um, rerouting of the intestines. So, you know, there is a risk that I guess when we place the band we could accidentally poke a hole in the stomach or the esophagus or something, but that's, that's pretty unlikely. Um, a lot of times people can have this done and they go home the same day. Um, and so for, in that regard, it's, it's um, quick, it's um, very safe, um, and the weight loss, um, a, a band patient who is about an average patient who does well after about two years of having the surgery, and say you're 100 pounds overweight, I'd like to use the, just the number of 50 just to keep, keep things simple, is about half of your excess weight. So you don't typically lose quite as much weight right, uh, in the year after surgery as you do uh, with any of the other, other operations. But um, successful patients with a lap band will, will lose quite a bit of weight. Um, we talked about it's safe, it's quick. Um, the weight loss is about 50% compared to the other surgeries, which, which are about 75. Um, problems with the band is there can be slips where the bottom part of the stomach slips underneath the band that can cause it to kink. Uh, erosions, the band can eat through the wall of the stomach. The tubing that's um, involved with the band can, can block or get twisted on intestines. I have seen that a few times. Um, the biggest problem with the lap band is that a lot of people who get lap bands don't have a good sense of uh, satiety or fullness when they eat. And so they're still hungry after they get it. And they continue to eat like they ate before they had the lap band and food will stack up in the stomach or in the esophagus and um, that can cause dilation of the little part of the stomach that's above the band or the esophagus and that can end up causing problems with swallowing and um, people sometimes have to have their bands taken out for that. I have seen studies fairly recently that show that up to like 40 to 50 percent of the people who get a lap band might not be successful with it and might not lose weight. Um, I don't know that it's that high in my personal experience. I think that people are, are more successful than that. But, you know, I haven't been doing these for 10 years, so we don't, we don't know. And once again, this is one of the, the flaws of any of these operations, is we don't really know what happens when we put lap bands in 20-year-old people and then they're 60 years old. Are all those bands going to have to come out? Are they going to have issues? Uh, you know, we just don't know. You know, we're doing the best we can with the information we have. Um, I think some people wouldn't have anything else done, like a sleeve or a bypass, because they're too afraid of the stapling and the cutting. And so I think it's definitely better to have a lap band and lose, lose some weight than it is to continue to be obese. Um, and I have a lot of patients who've had a lap band and they are just rocking along doing great. So I think more surgeons around the country are probably not doing lap bands, or we're all doing fewer lap bands probably than we used to, but I still think it's a reasonable thing to have in the bariatric um, armamentarium, so to speak, and I think we're going to continue to put lap bands in, but maybe just not as many. And in the right patients, you know, people do very well. Uh, the other surgery that I'll talk about is the sleeve. It's not been around as, as long as the other two, probably. Uh, you know, 
people are having over five year data on the sleeve. I just went to a big meeting in New York City where they spent the whole four or five, four days talking about the sleeve. And um, good things about the sleeve is what we do is we go in and we remove about 75% of the stomach. And this part of the stomach is taken out, it's gone forever. And um, so in that regard, it's not reversible, whereas the other operations potentially are reversible because we're taking this out and your body is, you know, is different after this. Your stomach is like a long banana or a sleeve. That's how it gets the name because it's kind of like a long, it's a long tube. And patients have very good control of hunger and the weight loss is, is similar to a gastric bypass, probably not quite as much, but it's similar in that 70% high 60% of the excess weight. So but when I say the percent, I mean, if you're 100 pounds over your ideal weight, then you should lose around 70, high 60 pounds range on average. Um, there is stapling, there's risk of bleeding, there's risk of leaks. And the biggest problem with the sleeve that I see is the risk of leak. Sleeve patients that get leaks, it's very difficult to control a leak. A lot of times people are in the hospital for weeks, have to have stents or drain tubes or feeding tubes put in, and um, it can be very stressful for everybody involved. And um, some studies show the leak rates as high as 5%, especially if somebody's had a band or some other procedure like a stomach wrap surgery, any previous surgery you've had to your stomach increases the chances of you having a leak. Um, and that's the dreaded complication with the sleeve. The sleeves can also narrow or stricture where they are too tight at one spot if food doesn't pass and you have to have that stretched. And one thing to remember is if people have problems with the sleeve, kind of the bailout thing to do is basically a gastric bypass procedure, uh, which, which uh, you know, rarely has to be done. Uh, most of the time, in my experience, knock on wood, my sleeve patients are, are, are very happy. They lose weight. Uh, they don't have a lot of issues. Long term, there's concerns that sleeve patients can develop severe heartburn. Um, usually it's controlled with uh, antacid medications, but, you know, uh, there's a chance that maybe it could be severe enough that you would have to have a gastric bypass or something done to control that heartburn. Um, but your intestines aren't rearranged, so you can easily get, get to your bile, uh, bile tube if you have a gallstone or something that could be caught in your bile tube, which is something that could be a problem with the gastric bypass. Um, vitamin problems, you can get vitamin deficiencies with the sleeve, but we think it's probably a lot less likely than with the gastric bypass because food is going over all parts of the intestines. And um, we put our patients on vitamins after a sleeve, um, but it's pretty unusual that you see a vitamin deficiency in a sleeve patient. Um, what else? You know, there can be bleeding problems. Uh, we talked about leaks. Long term, you worry about heartburn. And, and the other thing with any of these is there's a risk of weight regain. If you lose 100 pounds and you're happy as you can be, and then you go back to your old ways and start, you know, eating at the drive-through all the time and eating a bunch of liquid calories. I always tell my patients, liquid calories are really hard, are really kind of the the way to to ruin the bariatric procedure. Drinking regular cokes, uh, drinking a lot of milk and dairy products, liquidy, creamy, cheesy things that go through very easily. Those things can quickly add up to calories and, and result in weight regain. Is why do you do this? I did bariatrics. I started to go into bariatrics because when I was in residency, I was seeing patients, and it seemed like everybody that I saw had a problem related to being obese. We were having diabetics with bad diabetic foot infections. We were having people with severe giant hernias terrible gallbladder problems, terrible cancers. They were all related to obesity. And so I thought, well, you know, bariatric surgeons are actually going at the, the root problem, which is obesity. And um, I do general surgery, I do trauma surgery still. Um, but bariatric surgery is very rewarding. You really get to help people get through a rough problem. You have your patients are so happy 
uh, when everybody starts, when everybody's doing well and the weight starts coming off and a lot of positive things start going on in their lives. So it's rewarding for me. And it also, I mean, I like to get to the root of the problem. And so um, that's kind of why I chose to do it. And I also like to do laparoscopic surgery. And um, thankfully, you know, our surgeries are all done laparoscopically. And um, I think other doctors will or that don't do bariatrics will often have a negative have negative thoughts about bariatric surgery because they see people who have had complications and I always have to remind them I was like look y'all you guys have seen people who've had issues most people in my experience and this is what I do tend to do very well and there aren't a whole lot of problems if the people keep their follow-ups and they are keep a close eye on them most people the most common thing I see people say is, I wish I would have done this sooner. So it's rewarding, I guess, number one. Number two is I like to do the surgeries because the surgeries are, uh, are um, to be I don't know how else to say it, they're kind of fun to do. Um, <laughs> it's um, cool getting in there. It's cool to get in there and do them uh, most of the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah you know, I guess it's, it's rewarding and, um, you know, most surgeons do like a gallbladder surgery, their patients are gone forever. And you, you know, you see them once or twice, they're better and they're gone. But with bariatrics, it's kind of, you know, it's almost like you get involved with a little bit of primary care as a surgeon because we follow people for years and years. Uh, and that's kind of fun. I mean, I'm on first name basis with a lot of my patients that I've done years ago. And they'll come in for a band adjustment or we're checking vitamin levels or something easy. And it's just kind of like, you know, what's going on. They they, uh, you know, you just get to know people. Um, so that's why I do it. I think it's a, I, th I believe it, it works. I think bariatric surgery works and um, I, 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 I believe in it. Good for you. And I believe in it too. <laughs> you asked them about the pre-op diet. Oh, yeah. I didn't yeah. mention that. We put our patients on a pre-op diet. Um, the liver carries a lot of fat and water in it and um, it, it drapes over the top of the stomach, which is where a lot of these operations, the, the hard part of the operation is going on. And if you go on a low calorie, high protein diet for a week or so before surgery, the liver will really shrink and it gets smaller and it's easier for the surgeon to get up there and do it. And there's a lot of commercially available diets out there. Um, I think we use bariatric advantage when we've had good luck with that. It's, it's reasonably, the cost is good and the patient's seem to be compliant with it so that's why we use it i i hated it but it works <laughs> it works I mean, it's, it's it's not a five-star dining but it's it, it it is effective yes it is all right thank you dr finale i all appreciate right. it thank you